This one goes out to the Irish guy who got really angry about the tomato-based pot roast that I cooked one time. He insisted that pot roast has plain brown gravy, and well, that sounds good to me today. The trick is how to make the gravy taste like something. We'll get there, but first the meat. Today I want sliceable pot roast rather than one that you break up into chunks, and to get the best slices, what you want to look for is an oblong piece of meat, meaning the muscle fibers run side to side instead of up and down. We will slice across the fibers. There's lots of cuts from the animal's hindquarters that people use for a sliceable pot roast, but this is from the shoulder. It's called the mock tenderloin because it kind of looks like a tenderloin, but it's not. It's one of the rotator cuff muscles. Much more intramuscular fat and better flavor than any kind of round roast. It is super chewy, but that's why we braise it for half a day. Just to save on dirty dishes, I'm oiling this up right in the cold pan, ton of pepper, a few big pinches of salt, and then I'll just smoosh everything around to get the roast coated. Then I'll turn on the heat to brown it. For a steak or something small, you really have to get the pan hot before you put the meat in. Otherwise, the inside will be overdone by the time the outside is brown. But this is a big, thick roast, so it's going to be fine. While that's heating up, I'll peel and dice a few shallots. Not necessary, but they'll help the gravy taste like something. And if I cut them small, they're pretty much just going to dissolve into the sauce over the long braise. Let's see how the meat is doing gonna need more color than that, but I really advise going easy. I'll actually turn the heat down a bit. You can brown or roast really slowly and it comes out just as good. If you're too aggressive with your heat, you end up scorching the pan like that. When that dissolves into the sauce, it's gonna make everything taste burned, especially in a plainly flavored dish like this. You can grab a, like a wet paper towel with some tongs and rub it off. Just deglaze that one bad spot of the pan while you leave all the good brown fond intact. My the heat is like medium, and I'm just going to go nice and slow, browning all the surfaces a bit. And if the brown is on the bottom of the pan or on the meat itself, it doesn't really matter. Everything is going to dissolve together in the braise. You just need some browning somewhere to create a base of flavor. And honestly, that's enough. People think you got to get maximum browning on every square millimeter, but you hit a point of diminishing returns where you mostly just risk creating burned flavors. That's good enough. I'll throw my shallots in and let them fry for a couple of minutes until brown, and I swear this will not be a tomato-y pot roast. You will not perceive a little squeeze of tomato paste as being tomato-y, especially if you brown it. A little just goes a really long way toward intensifying the taste of a gravy. Once that's browned, it's time to deglaze, and sure, I'll use a carton of beef stock because I have one, but it really doesn't make a huge difference. You could just use water. You know what I need? I need my broad wooden spoon, the queen of all cooking utensils. Use that to scrape all the brown stuff off the bottom. If you look at those instant brown gravy packets they sell, the ingredients are mostly just garlic powder, onion powder, maybe some powdered dry mushroom or yeast extract for umami, but if you don't have that, you could just use some soy sauce, and then some assorted dry herbs. Also, those packets have starch for thickening, but we'll do that later. Reduce the heat to a simmer, cover so that the exposed meat steams. You could transfer this to the oven. I would do 275 Fahrenheit, 135 Celsius, but I'm going to do it all on the stove today. This will take hours to soften. It's an easy meal, but not a quick one. If you need something for a weekday, consider cooking with HelloFresh, sponsor of this video. Let's see what's on their always seasonal menu this autumn. Looks like some cozy stuff. I think I'll do these Korean barbecue wraps. These are going to take like 10 minutes. HelloFresh recipes rarely take any longer than 20 or 30, and each bag comes with all of the ingredients you're going to need, pre-portioned. You don't have to think about what to do with the leftover ingredient that's probably just going to end up sitting in your pantry until the next time you move. But if you do move, you can change your address with a few taps in the HelloFresh app, or change delivery days, pause deliveries. There's a kid-friendly plan, veggie plan, pescatarian, fit and wholesome. HelloFresh can be a great way to keep to your goals, because they do the grocery shopping for you, and that keeps you away from some temptation. Plus, cooking this way is more sustainable, according to a couple of studies. Cooking from a kit massively reduces your food waste. These are going to be sweet and spicy and delicious. I've got a great deal for you this time. Go to HelloFresh.com and use code AdamRagusia65 for 65% off plus free shipping. Use my link and code in the description. Get 65% off HelloFresh with my code AdamRagusia65. Thank you, HelloFresh. Here's the roast like two hours later. I'll rotate it so that the other side can soak a bit. Oh, sorry, I steamed you. If I poke at the meat a little, I can tell that it's starting to soften, but it's going to need like another two hours until it's really tender. When I think I'm an hour, 
hour, hour and a half away, I will start leisurely working on my vegetables. Carrots will take the longest to cook, so those first. I think I'll do big, hearty chunks today. Skinny ones can be whole pieces. Fat ones I'll cut in half lengthwise. Honestly, you could have the carrots in from the beginning. Overcooked carrots are still pretty good. Overcooked potatoes are not. In a stew, they fall apart and they make the gravy all gritty. It helps to use waxy potatoes, but I would not put these in until the meat is pretty close to being done. When in doubt, wait, because you could always take the meat out and hold it while the vegetables catch up. I've got some celery that I'll cut into big hearty chunks, and the last thing I'll put in is some big chunks of green onion. I love these in stews, but I would only cook these for like a 20 minutes max. I'll chop up the greens and save them for garnish. Roast has been simmering for almost five hours, and when I push on it, I can feel the meat fibers pulling apart. I actually think I overcooked this a bit. If you want to be able to slice your meat, you've got to stop braising just before it gets fall apart tender. I will take that out. Give the veggies another few minutes until they're almost fork tender. Remember, they're going to keep softening even after you take them out. I'm taking everything out with a slotted spoon and transferring it to a heat safe platter that I could hold in a warm oven until it's time to eat. Time to finish the gravy. Sometimes I thicken at the beginning so that I don't have to pull all the food out, but the advantage of doing it at the end is you don't have to guess how much thickener you're going to need. It's not necessary, but I think one of the easiest ways to sex up a gravy is to throw in a packet or two of powdered gelatin. You can scatter that right onto the sauce, but it's safer to disperse it in a little cool water first to avoid clumps. It just needs to sit for a few minutes and bloom, thicken. You'll see it happening. Stir that into the sauce, and it won't do much to thicken, at least not at such a low concentration, but it will give the sauce a really sticky, glossy finish that I associate with good French cooking, even though this is ostensibly Irish. I'm really just trolling that Irish guy today. For my main thickener, I'm using a cornstarch slurry, but you could use any starch or flour. Just disperse it in a small amount of cool water, cool so that the starch doesn't gelatinize prematurely and clump. Speaking of which, you gotta drizzle really slowly and stir vigorously as you do this, or else you're gonna get little ropes of starch in your stew. That looks like enough for now. Let's taste that plain brown gravy, and it's not bad. It's a little bland. Needs acid and pungency, and a great way to get both is with some mustard, any tart mustard. That's a great way to elevate a plain gravy while not turning it into a curry or something. It still tastes Northwestern European in that way that is bland at worst, but clear and clean at best. No one will know if you summon forth the upside down bear. They'll just know that the gravy tastes better. A little sugar or honey just enhances everything else. Adjust seasoning and all of that. Remember that the gravy is going to thicken more as it cools to eating temperature. So yeah, we're done. Time to slice our beef against the grain. Yeah, see, I overshot the mark and now it's shredding a bit as I slice. It's fine, obviously. It's gonna look great once it's covered in gravy, and there's certainly no shortage of gravy. Really satisfying and comfy, that is. Fall came all at once this year in East Tennessee, and in that context, this is really hitting the spot.